Okay, if you would open up, please, to Acts chapter 5. We're going to get back into our uh, study through Acts. We've been in Acts on Wednesday nights as well. I encourage you to listen to last uh, Wednesday's message, For the Love of Money. Very interesting story about God disciplining the early church by striking down Ananias and Sapphira. Recorded for us in Acts chapter 5. Uh, verses 1 through 11. So if you missed that, go back and check that out. It's online. And we're going to read Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16 this morning. Uh, And this is part two of a message we did a couple of weeks ago called Jesus, Our Healer. Jesus, Our Healer. So this is part two. Acts 5, verse 12. And through the hands... Of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. As a recap from the message a couple of weeks ago, we saw a miraculous healing Uh, Peter and John healed a lame man in Acts chapter 3. You remember the lame man was lame from his mother's womb daily. He was over 40 years old. Daily he was laid uh, at the beautiful gate, the entrance of the temple, begging for money, begging for alms. They didn't have uh, welfare programs uh, in place in this country at this time. And so it was really just begging uh, alms from the people of God that would have mercy and compassion On him, and that was his daily grind. That's what he always thought his life was going to be. He looked at Peter and John and and, and he asked for some money, and Peter looked at him and, and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And it's the first recorded miracle in the book of Acts, healing miracle. Uh, And this would be a pattern throughout the book of Acts, that there'll be one miraculous healing after another, uh, in addition to even resurrections and and those being raised from the dead, because the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon the early church. And Jesus, you remember, had said, you're going to do the same works that I have done. So we read Uh, Peter tells him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk in Acts chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 7. He took him by the right hand, he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Skip to verse 12 of Acts 3. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses, and his name, the prince of life, the king of kings, the lord of lords, Jesus of Nazareth, his name, through faith in his name, the name of Jesus, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So this great miracle takes place. It's done in the name and the power of Jesus Christ, showing that Jesus' body uh, was still here on the earth, even though his body was physically ascended, resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father. His body collectively is the church. He is the head, and we are the body, and we are the members of the body of Christ. And so now the body of Christ, through the church, uh, was doing these incredible miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in the church. But this resulted in 
uh, great persecution. And this is really when persecution began in earnest. Very early on in the church's history, the church began to be persecuted. Peter and John were actually arrested for doing this good deed, for healing this man. And it was the same people that arrested Jesus. Uh, the uh, Caiaphas and Annas, the high priest and the, and the high priest's son-in-law, uh, and, and the Sadducees, those who controlled uh, the Supreme Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin, uh, who did not believe in miracles and they did not believe uh, in resurrections from the dead. And so they brought in these same individuals who had brought Jesus in on the night that he was betrayed and then turned him over to Pilate to have him crucified, they arrest Peter and John and bring them in uh, to basically interrogate them uh, about this miraculous healing. No good deed goes unpunished. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, Peter says this about this healing. He says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole in Jesus' name, in the power of Jesus' name, under the authority of Jesus' name. That's how this man is healed and whole today. No fear, no fear of consequences, no fear of imprisonment, no fear of torture or, or, or being beaten up uh, because uh, of them preaching Christ. Uh, remember Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse uh, 12, he said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, verse 13 of John 14, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so he's saying here, the works that you have observed while you've walked with me for these last three and a half years, he says, you're going to do the same things. You're going to see the same miracles, and you're going to do it in my name. Whatever you ask in my name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, in the name of Jesus, in the powerful name of Jesus. These healings took place. In John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says this about those uh, in, in him and in, in his name. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so you will be my disciples. So it has to be a disciple who is doing these works in Jesus' name. It can't just be anybody. It can't just be somebody who's out there doing their own thing and trying to call on Jesus' name to have miracles done. He says, no, for you, if you are my disciples, and, and if you're my disciple, you're going to abide in me, and my words are going to abide in you. And so those who are submitted to God's word, surrender to God's word, you know, crucified with Christ, no longer living uh, for themselves, but living for God. Those are the disciples, he says, and you're going to do these miracles, even the miracles that you see uh, that I have done. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus said this, If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples, or you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so what, what is it that is a disciple? How did even Jesus describe discipleship? Well, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said this about if you want to become one of his disciples and have the power of his name at work in your life, then he said to them all, Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross every day and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Who gains the whole world and loses his soul. So Jesus tells us this. He defines it for us. If you claim to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, this is how Jesus defines a disciple. If anyone desires to come after me to be my disciple, let him deny himself, 
Let him take up his cross daily and follow me. So to be a disciple, you must be fully surrendered to Christ. And you must die to yourself and die to your flesh every single day. It's mortifying the flesh, mortifying the lust of the flesh, and the desires of my old nature. We must reckon the old man dead, the scriptures say, and be alive to Christ. We must mortify our old nature. That is what a disciple is. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And this is something that we have to do Every single day. It's the reality of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning over your life. Where you say you're a Christian. And you say you're surrendered. Well the evidence is going to be if you abide in me. And my words abide in you. And you're denying yourself daily. You're taking up your cross. Literally mortifying your flesh. Crucifying your old nature every day. And then the power of Christ uh, will be at work in a powerful and mighty way in your life and in my life. You remember that Paul the Apostle tells us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 about this. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So to be a disciple is to walk out a crucified life. Life, a life of self-denial. That is what a disciple is. And then if you are a disciple, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead to my old nature, to my sin nature, to my old man. I've reckoned my old man dead. I mortify, I crucify my flesh every single day, surrendering anew every single day to God. Then Jesus said, you'll be my disciple. Then you could ask anything in my name and I will do it. That's what the promise is for. Those who are fully, completely surrendered to Christ. And that unleashes the power of God in your life. Because then God gets all the glory. A couple of weeks ago, I encourage you to go back and listen to the message if you weren't here. We looked at several different examples of these miraculous healings taking place in the book of Acts. And then also uh, in the Gospels and through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus healed those who were paralyzed. He healed those and gave sight to the blind. He healed lepers who had leprosy, and he even raised the dead. The scriptures say that Jesus healed all manner of sickness and disease. God still has the power to heal us today. He doesn't always heal us, and eventually we're all going to die of something. Uh, 50 years from now, most of us will not be here. Uh, perhaps a few, some might still be here 50 years from now, but I can pretty much guarantee it 100 years from now, none of us will be here. Eventually, uh, our sin, which we are under the curse of of the sin of the human race, uh, is going to uh, put this old man to death, and we are going to go back to the dust. And that is uh, inevitable for all of us in this flesh. However, that's not the end for the Christian. Our spirit then is free to go to be with the Lord, and then we are promised to have a resurrection A resurrected body, a perfect body like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. But just because not everybody is going to be healed every time that we pray for them, it doesn't mean that God doesn't still heal today or that he cannot heal today. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at some examples of God's healing uh, at the end of the message, some some examples personally that I've witnessed. Uh, But again, in heaven, we will all be healed. That's when there's going to be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more disease. It's going to be a place of perfection. This is not yet heaven on earth. Yet, God's power is still at work in this world through the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, when God does choose to heal in the scriptures or in our lives, uh, it happens when God overrules the laws of nature because God created the laws of nature. That's why God could do anything. He could give a sight to a man who was born blind or uh, heal the spinal cord of a man who was born paralyzed. God could even raise up the very dead. And so we know that there's nothing that's impossible for God. God can superimpose his own will upon a situation and choose to heal uh, if he so desires. And so we're going to look at some examples of this today. Of course, God is omnipotent. Jesus Christ is God. Therefore, Jesus is omnipotent, which means that he has all power. There's nothing difficult. There's nothing impossible for our God. 
Now you remember that sickness did not exist prior to the curse. Sickness and death came in as a result of the curse in the Garden of Eden. It was as a result of man's rebellion against God. Man's sin, which ultimately will lead to death. Uh, again, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The soul that sins shall die. And unless we survive until the rapture of the church, we're all going to end up facing the grave in this old body. Flesh and blood, the corrupted flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But when Jesus chooses to heal here and now, he pauses the curse. Again, you heal someone now, they're going to die of something later, but it, it doesn't change the fact that God can superimpose his will. He can overrule the laws of nature and science, and he could choose to heal now, to pause or reverse the effects of the curse temporarily. And, and we're going to look at that, uh, in, in some examples of that here as well uh, this morning. In James chapter 5, this great scripture on uh, how to pray for healing in the New Testament church, James tells us this in James 5.13. <clears throat> Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. James 5.14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. There it is, the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, you're going to do these miracles in my name. And the prayer of faith, verse 15, will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. <clears throat> so sometimes sickness is tied to sin. That's the, what's being taught here. Not all times, but sometimes Sickness can be a result of sin in someone's life. And, and, and so here is the prescription that God gives to the church. If anyone is sick, <clears throat> let him call for the elders of the church. Let the elders pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. <clears throat> and so we often have requests for folks who want us to do this for them. And we are happy to pray for any of you if you want prayer with the elders and with the anointing of oil. Um, sometimes we call people up here on stage, but oftentimes it's done behind the scenes. Uh, and we do believe and we do see uh, miraculous healings taking place. Again, sometimes the Lord chooses to use the medications, the surgeons, and the doctors. Sometimes God chooses not to use uh, the medications and the surgeons uh, and the doctors. Uh, Danny Fregolti, our brother who's uh, a, a traveling evangelist, uh, as it were, and, a, and an apologist, He'll tell you his story. He's on our prayer team. He'll tell you his story of miraculous healing where God restored his busted Achilles heel that was ripped in two. It, was, it had popped. And God healed his, his Achilles heel in his foot instantaneously. And, and, and he's completely healed from that decades later. Uh, and that's a miracle because even surgeons can't repair the Achilles heel perfectly when you go in under surgery. And so there are examples of, of supernatural healings that do take place and uh, just uh, ask people and, and, and it'll, it'll encourage you and it'll strengthen your faith to know God still heals today. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> Peter tells us this in verse 24. Well, we could start in verse 23 of 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. And so Jesus' death atoned for our sins, and sickness uh, in the world is the result of the curse in sin. And so very oftentimes, uh, it is the act of prayer and the act of belief, the faith of the believer, uh, and, and trusting in the Lord, and the Lord will, will heal as he forgives uh, our sins. Not every sickness is the result of sin, certainly not in the scriptures or in uh, ex real experiences that we see. But the scriptures do say that there were many examples uh, when uh, folks were sick because of, of sin or even demonic uh, oppression or possession. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 8, we read this. Matthew uh, quotes that same verse from Isaiah chapter 53. 
in Matthew 8, 16. When evening had come, they brought to him, to Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So the fruit of, of, of sin uh, and the curse is sickness and death. Jesus, by his suffering, he took our sins upon himself on the cross. He took the punishment for our sins so Jesus Christ can release the power of healing uh, physically and spiritually, mentally, emotionally, if he chooses to. We just come to him by faith. Jesus paid the price for it all on the cross. Again, none of us are going to get out of here alive unless Jesus Christ raptures us. There'll be one generation uh, that will see the return of Christ and they will be raptured. It's appointed unto man once to die, the scriptures say, after this, the judgment. But there's one generation that will not see death. Could be our generation. It sure looks like we're living in the last days, but it might be 50 years from now, 100 years from now or more. Uh, but other than that, all the rest of us, we are going to succumb uh, to the natural order uh, and cycle of life, which is birth and life and then uh, death, physically speaking. But that's not the end for the believer. Now, as we uh, have seen and as we have already read here this morning, some of the uh, sicknesses that are uh, healed in the scriptures are the result of demonic and satanic activity. Again, you can't just put a, a broad brush over the, the, the issue and say it's always because of sin, sickness, or it's always because of demonic activity, because that's not the case. But sometimes it is because of sin. Sometimes it is the result of a demonic attack or someone who has opened the doors to the occult, and then there is a sickness or a disease uh, that comes on as a result of this demonic possession or this uh, demonic oppression. For example, we read in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was just kicking off his earthly ministry. We read in verse 23 of Matthew 4, Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. There was no problem for God to heal whatever sickness and disease it was. There was no limitations. Verse 24, then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. So those who were sick, those who were tormented, those who were, uh, had epilepsy, those who were paralyzed, brought them all to Jesus, and Jesus healed them all. And we see here that some of this sickness is very likely tied to demonic possession or demonic activity. As a matter of fact, we see that in Acts chapter 5, where we started this morning. In Acts chapter 5, verse 16, also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So there is some connection, and there can be some connection between demonic activity and sickness. Again, not exclusively, not always, but sometimes. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 6, we read about Philip. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, Acts 8, 7. For unclean spirits, these would be demons crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there you see it again. Three times, we just look at three scriptures where those are, there's sick people, there's paralyzed people, there's uh, people who um, are lame, they cannot walk. And then there is this unclean spirit, this possession that's also in the same verse. And so we know that there are some times that demonic possession results in sickness, physical sickness and ailment. Uh, another example of this is in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 15. We start in verse 14. <coughs> Matthew 17, 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him. This is to Jesus. And saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic 
He was having seizures. He suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. He has seizures, and he's hurting himself. He's falling into water. He's, he could kill himself this way, he's saying. He's harming himself. He says, so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So that's probably the clearest example in the scriptures, or one of the clearest examples, of someone who is demonically oppressed, demonically possessed perhaps, that demon resulted in some sort of a epilepsy and seizures, massive seizures that would come upon him. And he would throw himself in the fire, burning himself, or he would throw himself in the water, potentially drowning himself. So this devil was trying to kill him. The disciples were not able to uh, cast this demon out. So this man, in desperation, brought his son to Jesus Christ. Jesus rebuked the demon, the devil. It came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. So there are some times where sickness can be the result of demonic activity, especially those who practice sorcery, who practice the occult, who practice Satanism, or who practice witchcraft, because they are then opening the floodgates. They're opening the door to demonic activity and demonic uh, influence in their lives. <clears throat> Verse 19 says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Very interesting. It's recorded for us here. And uh, Jesus says this, that this kind, no doubt this uh, possession that he was dealing with, uh, would not go out except by prayer and fasting. Well, it tells us two things. The disciples were not praying and fasting or else they would have been able to cast this demon out by themselves. That's Jesus' answer. And number two, Jesus was praying and fasting all the time. And so this is a, a good instruction for you and I to have power in prayer, to have prow power even in uh, the battle in, in the spiritual realm prayer and fasting. Again, fasting is denying the flesh, denying the self, uh, old nature, starving the flesh, and then you feed the spirit through the word and through prayer. You fast and pray, and then uh, you have uh, this uh, power available to you uh, when it comes to um, exercising a demon or, or, or casting out a demon out of somebody who's demon-possessed, spiritual warfare. You know, we are Coming up on to Halloween, it's, it's, it's right around the corner. We're going to have, as we always do, a Halloween alternative here. We're not celebrating Halloween here on October 31st. We're celebrating not darkness, but Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Uh, it is a time of fun. It, it is a time of light, not a time of darkness and death. Uh, it, it's not a time of, of gore and, and, and fear. It's a time of, of light and life and joy and peace and truth for you to bring your kids somewhere. And we invite you to come out. It's a great time. We put on a, a really fantastic, it's not quite a carnival, but it really is a festival, a harvest festival. Uh, every year we get more and more people uh, to support it and more and more people coming from outside the church and so we invite you to come here on October 31st for our Halloween alternative. Bring your kids, or even if you don't have kids, come on out and, and, and have some fun here. And that way you don't have to worry about running out of candy and kids knocking on your door and so forth. Uh, and, and you could just be here with your church family um, on um, Halloween so that, so that you can celebrate Jesus here instead of the world which is celebrating death and darkness and witchcraft uh, and evil. Matter of fact, I was talking to... Uh, a brother this morning, a brother Brian, who works in the sound booth, and he came out of Satanism. And if you ever want to hear if Satanism is real and you want to hear about uh, how people can open the doors to satanic influences and to the devil himself, it's scary stuff. And it's very, very real. And Satanism is one of the fastest growing religions in America today and around the world. Witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America. Uh, it's no longer anything to see people wearing, um, you know, witches' uh, garb and, and, and witches' symbolism uh, on their necklaces, on their chains, on their clothes, 
on their purses, tarot cards and uh, Ouija boards, sold all over in normal places now. It's no longer uh, hidden. It's come out from the shadows and it's become normalized. It's become acceptable to our culture, especially among the young women. And uh, witchcraft is very, very real. Uh, There is a power, uh, but it is a demonic power. And it's a very dangerous thing to open the doors through witchcraft, through sorcery, through the practice of tarot card readings or psychic readings or palm readings or all of these things or astrology. All of this is forbidden from God in the scriptures all the way back to the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And for the child of God, we are not to participate in the unfruitful works of darkness any longer, but rather expose them. Ephesians tells us, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, I, 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 have to, I, I feel like I have to share this because um, witchcraft is, is permeating our culture so much that I'm afraid it's going to begin to permeate the church because it's just normalized now and it's accepted, especially among the younger people. But we have to have a biblical understanding. This is forbidden by God because it is satanic at its roots. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9, we read this back in the law of, of Moses. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found anyone among you who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a sorcerer, or a soothsayer rather, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Verse 12, For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations, which you will dispossess, listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you thousands of years ago this was going on guys this is this is not new there's nothing new under the sun witchcraft and sorcery and trying to contact the dead through seances and mediums and spiritists and psychics this goes back thousands of years and it was forbidden by god thousands of years ago this was written 3500 years ago god has not changed his mind about sorcery or witchcraft just because it's popular and it's in vogue today uh, in the world and in the western world certainly Notice here that he says, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That's where they would offer their children, their babies, as a human sacrifice to their gods, to Molech or Baal or one of the other gods. And they would literally burn the child with fire as an offering, as a sacrifice to these evil gods that Satan was behind, these demonic uh, powers. And, And they did this to get power, offering their children as sacrifices. But what are we doing here today? In America, we're butchering babies by the tens of millions in the womb. Not just with the fire of the saline solution of the abortionist needle that they stick the needle into the baby and inject them full of saline solution that literally burns the child to death from the inside in the womb. But now they're actually taking the babies with fully formed lungs and hearts and brains and they are dissecting them alive in the womb. And they're taking out the little hearts and the little brains and the little lungs and they're putting them into oxygen so that they could keep them alive. And then they're using them for scientific research at major universities. This is happening. This is true. And so you think how terrible it was that they did this 3,500 years ago. I would say we are doing far worse. We're certainly killing many more babies than they ever killed in Bible times. In, in, in America alone, we've killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 62 or 63 million babies and counting in the womb. And so this is all evil. This is all satanic. You know, the church of Satan actually sued several states recently about their... Um, abortion laws because what happened was is after the supreme court overturned roe v wade some of the very conservative states they outlawed abortion almost completely outlawed abortion some of them i think that some of them have the 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 heartbeat law where once the baby's six weeks old and has a heartbeat you can no longer abort the baby after six weeks well the church of satan is suing in the courts these these states and these state legislatures and saying wait a second 
we have religious freedom. We offer human sacrifice to Satan through abortions, and you're preventing us from practicing our religion. You can't make this stuff up. This is happening. And so we have to understand the abomination before God, the wickedness. There's nothing more wicked than slaughtering innocent babies in the womb. And again, we're doing it by the tens of millions. Don't be surprised when the judgment of God falls upon America. If it's only because of the issue of abortion, uh, we are overdue for the wrath of God to be poured out upon our nation because we are unrepented as a nation. And it's continuing, especially here uh, in the state of California. We're the worst with abortion uh, in the whole world practically. But he said, there shall, shall not be among you found anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, offers them as a sacrifice to Satan, <clears throat> or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. And again, in our entertainment today, this is all being glamorized. It's all being glorified, isn't it? All over the media and all over the movies and the TV shows and everything else. And we have become so desensitized to all of this that we have accepted this now uh, as normal and, 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 you know, innocuous. That somehow uh, it, it is not dangerous. It's like, oh, they're just having fun and they're just going through a phase. And No, this is satanic. It's evil. If you've ever dealt with demonic possession or you've ever dealt with haunted houses or things like that, that's how ghosts, they're not ghosts, they're demons, come into houses and haunt them. It's because people are opening the doors to the practice of uh, witchcraft and Satanism and astrology and tarot card reading and so forth. And if you are listening online and you are practicing this sort of thing, I encourage you to repent of it, burn all the stuff, get rid of it, all of your spell books and all of your charms and your tarot cards and your Ouija boards, get it out of your house because demons are attached to those things. Uh, and, and pray and Jesus will heal you and Jesus will set you free uh, from the power of darkness. Greater is he that is in me, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in this world. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27, God was very uh, serious about this. He said this to his people. Leviticus 20, 27. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has a familiar spirit. This would be like a demonic spirit where they go into a trance, altered state of consciousness. They either get possessed by the spirit or they have a spirit whispering in their ear and, and they are kind of a medium. He says, anyone who does this shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. It was that serious to God. It was deadly serious to God in Old Testament times. God did not play around. Uh, today, we don't, you know, execute. There's not capital punishment for uh, sins against God or crimes against God anymore for anything, really, in, in our nation. I mean, even, even Jeffrey Dahmer, who's now been famous again because of this Netflix documentary that glamorizes and glor glorifies all of his satanic practices and cannibalism, and homosexuality and uh, just ab abominable stuff. Um, we are becoming so desensitized to this. But not even Jeffrey Dahmer got the death penalty in the court after killing 17 boys, murdering, raping, and eating uh, many of them. He still didn't get the death penalty. Uh, and so we've sure gone a long way from, from Bible days where they would take them out uh, and stone them for practicing these things. New Testament, God doesn't change his mind about this being a sin. In Galatians chapter 5, we read this in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I told you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, thank God, God can forgive you for any of that if you come to Jesus Christ. But if you continue to practice these things, there remains, he says, no salvation for you. He says, those who practice these things are not going to heaven. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Don't even dabble into sorcery because it is listed here as one of the sins or the works of the flesh, which if you're practicing it, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's right there 
in verse 20, sorcery, and it's right next to idolatry because really sorcery is idolatry. It's the worship of Satan uh, and his demons, the fallen angels. Of course, sorcery also could be mind-altering drug use, which is on the rise again in our culture today. Uh, sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia. Pharmakia is where we get the English word pharmacy from, and it would speak to those who would go into an altered state of consciousness through drugs or alcohol in order to be opened up to the spirit realm, then to practice their witchcraft or to do their seances or their spells <clears throat> or curses or whatever they're going to do. <clears throat> and so uh, it is forbidden by God. M you, the use of mind-altering drugs or taking drugs or even alcohol to the point uh, of being an open vessel for spirits uh, is forbidden for us, for the child of God. But sorcery is going to be uh, practiced like never before when the Antichrist is here, of course, because they're going to be worshiping uh, the devil himself at that time. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20, we're told this about those during the Great Tribulation period. He says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons. Again, when you're practicing witchcraft, you are worshiping demons. And idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality, or their theft. So that is going to define the generation of the Antichrist when the Antichrist is ruling and reigning over this earth for a short time, for three and a half years. This is what the people are going to be doing. They're going to be worshiping demons. They are going to be practicing murder. They are going to be practicing sorcery, uh, as well as porneo, or sexual immorality and uh, theft. And so... Uh, this, is, this is something we want to completely turn away from and we want to avoid. Uh, one more scripture, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral... The sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so you cannot practice witchcraft or sorcery and go to heaven. That's the point I'm trying to make. You're not going to be taken out and stoned anymore. That Thank God that we're you know, not just dragging people out and stoning them to death. Otherwise, you know, they used to stone teenagers in the Bible too who were rebellious against their parents. Could you imagine? It'd be the end of the world if all the teenagers who were rebellious were taken out and stoned as was commanded in the Old Testament law. Uh, we are not under the law now. We're under grace. So God just doesn't wipe us out. Thank the Lord that he gives us time to repent. But it does not mean that we can practice these things Things and think that we are saved and going to heaven or that we are Christians practicing sorcery, Satanism, or witchcraft. And I, I just feel like I have to talk about that because, I mean, it's just permeating the airwaves and, uh, and, and, and the media and the social media, especially for uh, the young girls uh, who are looking for power. Now, <clears throat> there, there's even some uh, mental illness in the scriptures that is... Uh, attributed to demonic possession and, and demonic activity. And so it's not just a physical ailment sometimes that are a result of uh, demonic activity, but, but it's also mental, psychological. We read in Luke chapter 8 and verse 26, the, the demon-possessed man of the gatherings. Luke 8, 26 says this, Then they sailed to the country of the gatherings, which is opposite of Galilee, so they're um, in the area of the Sea of Galilee. I've actually been here to this garden of, of the Gadarenes. I've, I've taught a sermon on this passage there in this place. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. He was demon-possessed for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in tombs. Interesting that the demonically possessed man wanted to walk around naked. I wonder if that's the reason that so many want to walk around naked today. Hardly wear any clothes. Wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. 
When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, <clears throat> for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. This is an incredible story. Of course, it's a true story. All the stories in the Bible are true. They really happened. <clears throat> that this man was possessed by a legion of demons. And the result was he was insane. He was violent. He lived in a cemetery or in a graveyard among the dead. He uh, cut himself uh, with rocks, we're told. They tried to chain him up to hold him in one place and he had this supernatural power to break free uh, from the chains and the bonds and the shackles uh, that they uh, put uh, him in <clears throat> and he was possessed by a legion of demons and a legion would be uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 Roman soldiers that was a legion and so he had somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 demons possessing him they begged him, verse 31, the demons begged Jesus that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. That's where their final end is going to be, in the abyss and in the lake of fire. They're going to follow Satan to his end, the lake of fire that Jesus said was created for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> now a herd of many swine, verse 32, was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he, wouldn't, that he would permit them to enter into them, the swine, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. Now when those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened, and, it, and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So fascinating, incredible, true story that this man had opened the door through the, probably the practice of the occult or Satanism, uh, human sacrifice, opened the door to all these demons. They took possession of him. He just completely became overtaken by uh, this legion of demons that had possessed him. And Jesus cast these demons out of this man and into a herd of swine. Now remember, swine, pigs were unclean animals uh, in, in, in Israel, still are to this day. They still eat kosher in Israel and they don't eat pork because they believe they're unclean animals because pigs will kind of eat anything. And, uh, and so they went into this, this herd of swine and then the demons drove the herd of the swine over violently over a cliff to kill them, to drown them. Why? So that they could, again, once their host was dead, so then they could be free to go and try and find another body to possess. Uh, I remember watching a documentary about this evil, satanic, brutal young guy in, I don't remember where it was, back east somewhere, um, and he changed his name to some demonic name, and he was a full-on practicing Satanist, and he was getting these guys with drugs and alcohol and sex to come to his place, and then they would murder people there and and bury them in the backyard, and uh, he, they never caught him. They didn't catch him for years, and I don't know how many he killed, four or five people, but he initiated all these people into Satan. He was, pl like, playing hard rock music, like, you know, really uh, uh, satanic music or whatever, and the kids were attracted to it. But eventually, um, somebody ratted him out, wanted to get out of the cult. People were scared that if they would leave his little cult that he would kill them because he did that before to others. This is a true story. And uh, he finally got put into prison, but what he had done was he had, he had filed his teeth into fangs to where he looked scary. And he looked just so demonic. But he filed his teeth into fangs so that he looked like an animal. And they put him into isolation because they were afraid that he... They put him on suicide watch in the prison or jail. And they were afraid that he was going to kill himself. And before he went to trial, he literally chewed his arm off with his fangs. And ripped out his veins... And bled to death. This is a true story. He was a full-blown Satanist. And you know why he did that? Because the demon couldn't use him anymore when he was in prison. 
The demon was using him to initiate the young men and young women and so forth into the cult. Once he was arrested, he was going to go down for life. The demon wanted out, so he chewed his own arm off. They said his arm was almost completely chewed off, and then he bled to death. Um, Again, you can't make this stuff up, but this is true. This stuff still happens to this day. This man was severely here, mentally ill, it would appear, due to the demonic possession. And so perhaps, uh, no doubt, there is some mental illness uh, that we see uh, in our world that is a result of demonic activity and demonic possession, schizophrenia, people hearing voices, etc. So it's interesting that Jesus had no problem with all these demons. He just cast them out. They were done, and this man was healed, and he was made whole. We read in verse 38, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city, what great things Jesus had done for him. At the end of verse 36, or verse 36 says, They also had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. And so he was healed of this psychosis and this madness and this self destructive behavior uh, by the power of Jesus Christ and the demons, this legion of demons being cast out. So again, Sometimes sickness and disease is the result of demonic activity. Again, sometimes sickness and disease are the result of bad choices and destroying the temple of God. The Bible tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My father died of alcoholism. He drank himself to death and he turned 62 years old. And within 60 days of, or maybe 75 days of his 62nd birthday, he, he died in his sleep. But he had destroyed his body through drinking hard liquor and alcohol his entire life. And so sometimes the penalty uh, is, is death physically when we destroy our, our body and we make bad choices into what we're putting into our body. People who smoke cigarettes will often die of some smoke related uh, smoking related disease emphysema or congestive heart failure or throat cancer or lung cancer uh, and so sometimes uh, our sicknesses are the result of our poor choices people that uh, use drugs and and, and party uh, sometimes become addicted to, to drugs and they never get off of it and they die of an overdose because of that addiction to drugs again they're destroying the temple of the holy spirit their bodies um, had a good friend who struggled with uh, meth addiction and every time that he'd get arrested he'd go into prison and he'd get cleaned up and he'd be on fire for Jesus and we would write letters to each other and then he'd get out and within six months of getting out of prison he'd go right back to the drugs because he just he, the the pull was so strong for him and in the end it killed him he was 42 years old and he was stabbed in the heart uh, with a screwdriver at 42 years old in Santa Maria and, and bled to death on his aunt and uncle's front porch uh, because of a drug deal gone bad or somebody that he had burned with a drug deal. And I, uh, I did his funeral. I officiated uh, his memorial service. I believe that he was saved because he didn't die immediately. Uh, he died, you know, 30 minutes after he was stabbed miraculously. So he had time to get right with God, I believe. Uh, but again, the result, the wages of sin is, is death. Sometimes it's instantaneous. And because of his addiction, because of his destroying his body through drugs and through methamphetamine, it cost him his life. There's those who practice um, sexual immorality and they sleep around. And that's very, very prominent and prevalent in our culture. Again, especially among the young people. And people end up getting HIV AIDS. Or, or they end up getting these terrible sexually transmitted diseases. Which there's no real cure for anymore. There's not even drugs you can treat these cases of gonorrhea or syphilis or chlamydia because these diseases have just adapted and adapted to the penicillin and there's just these superbugs now. Uh, and so people will suffer physically with physical uh, uh, infirmities based on poor choices. In Luke chapter 5, we see that Jesus healed a man that it was very likely that this man uh, was suffering from some physical ailment as a result of a sin. He was paralyzed as a result. We read in Luke 5, 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. 
Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and they let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. There was such a crowd in the house they couldn't get to him with their buddy who was paralyzed. So they literally took the roof off, the thatched roof off the top of the house and, and dropped his bed down with ropes right there in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, no doubt his buddies wanted him to say, rise up and walk and you're healed. But that's not what Jesus said. Indicating that that man's greatest need was having his sins forgiven. That was the greatest healing that this man needed, even more so than his paralysis. Many Bible commentators also believe that this man's sickness was a result of some sexually transmitted disease uh, that had just ravished his, his body, gonorrhea or, or, or something. And so his greatest need was that his sins would be forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man that was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Well, Jesus Christ healed this man, a paralyzed man. And the man was able to stand up and walk, but more than that, Jesus proved that he had the power to heal the soul of this man, to forgive this man's sins, and only God can forgive sins. They were right to say, who, who are you? You must think you're God. And Jesus is like, yeah, I am God. I am the Son, the only begotten Son of God, and here's how I'll prove it to you. Take your bed, you are healed, rise up and walk, and his sins were forgiven. You remember Jesus forgave the woman who was caught in adultery. They were going to stone her. Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. They all left from the youngest to the oldest, dropped the stones on the ground. Jesus was writing with his finger in the sand. And then Jesus looked up to the woman and said, where are your accusers? She says, I don't know. They're all gone. And he says, well, neither do I condemn you. In other words, I forgive you. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Neither do I condemn you. He said, go forth and sin no more. Jesus forgives sins. That's the greatest healing that we need because again, we could be healed physically over and over again throughout a lifetime, but eventually we're still going to die of something. And if we die in our sins, then we're going to die eternally in hell forever and ever. So it's better that we are healed spiritually through faith in Jesus Christ, through forgiveness of our sins and trusting Jesus for our salvation than any physical healing, really. Uh, and that is the, the, the point. Again, in James chapter 5 and verse 15, where we had started uh, th this morning, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will forgive them. So our greatest need is forgiveness of our sins. And, and, and our temporal physical healing is very much secondary uh, to the spiritual healing that we all need. Again, I've witnessed so many miraculous healings in my lifetime as, as a pastor. I, I really, it, it, I started to write down examples, but I literally probably could have spent the entire hour talking about examples, personal examples, that I have personally witnessed myself of God's dramatic, miraculous healings. Uh, we have uh, Madeline Lorelei, who's one of our women's uh, teachers, and she's one of our Sunday school teachers. She was diagnosed with a cancer that was in several places in her body, uh, and an infection in her spinal cord, and she was going paralyzed, and the doctors didn't know what it was, and they, they couldn't touch it, and she was getting worse and worse. And I remember in Tatchby, she asked me to anoint her with oil uh, in obedience to the uh, command in James, and uh, went and anointed her with oil, and the doctors had pretty much given up hope. And uh, almost immediately, they found out what the cause, an infection, uh, like a MRSA sort of infection, had penetrated her brain and her spinal cord through an infected tooth, actually. And like the next day after we prayed for her, they found it, and they gave her the treatment, and she was healed. And she, 
counts this, as, she'll tell you her story, as a miraculous healing from God. Because she said it was only after we prayed that Jesus gave the doctors the wisdom to heal her. We had another friend in Tehachapi. Her name was Tamara, uh, who was diagnosed with pancreatic, I believe it was pancreatic cancer stage four. They gave her uh, anywhere from six weeks to six months to live. And I remember she asked me to pray for her, and the doctors had no hope. This was a, a cancer that she had dealt with before and had surgery and had come back. And again, we prayed for her, anointed her with oil, and miraculously, incredibly, uh, they were able to remove that cancer. She went through the chemotherapy treatment, and she was cancer-free, and she's alive today some 15, 20 years later. And they had told her she had no more, even with surgery and drugs, no more than six months to live. It's a miracle. God used the doctors in this case. He used the drugs uh, and the medications. I remember we had a little sweet old widow in Tehachapi whose name was Laverne. She was in a coma and she was dying. Her, you know, uh, brain waves were not active and they, she was on a respirator and her family had come to say their last goodbyes and they were all crying because nobody got to say goodbye to her. Real sweet, dear little old lady. And I prayed for her and I told them, I said, I believe that, that God is going to allow her to, to say her goodbyes. I feel this very strongly. And the doctors are like, no, she ain't coming back. You know, once we take her off this ventilator, she's gone, you know. And the family said, well, go ahead and take her off the ventilator. They knew eventually they were going to have to. They took her off the ventilator. And instead of her dying, she opened her eyes. She sat up and she began to, she couldn't talk, but she began to communicate with through touch and through her looks and, you know, basically letting them all know that she was going to be okay. Uh, and within 30 minutes, she passed away. And so there's just things like that I've seen over and over and over again uh, in my life. We've seen God heal in this church. We just saw Rosalind, who you just had a triple bypass and how well she is doing. And, and, and these surgeries could always, as you know, go the other way. This is an answer to our prayers. And uh, my, my mother-in-law, Patty Cervantes, diagnosed with stage uh, to pancreatic cancer. They, they, they said that 75% of the time when you get a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, uh, you, you don't even live to see five years from that point. She's completely cancer-free. She just had, uh, she had her chemotherapy. She had her surgery. She just had her final PET scan. Pray for her. We get the results tomorrow from her uh, oncologist. But I'm trusting the Lord that the cancer is gone. And no matter what the doctors say and all the odds and probabilities that God has healed uh, Patty, and she has trusted the Lord, and we prayed for her. Laura Cromer, sick with cancer. She's cancer-free now. Uh, Julia Roscoe, a pastor's wife, a good friend of mine who had breast cancer, stage three. She's healed, and she's cancer-free now uh, in Santa Maria. Um, little little Carico, whose arm was broken, and he's already healing. Little five-year-old grandson of Pastor Mike Lynn, who fell in Poor little guy broke his arm on the monkey bars out here a few weeks ago. And uh, they didn't need to have surgery. And his arm is healing, you know, incredibly well. All of these, I believe, are the healings of God in our midst. And so I do believe that God still heals today. Uh, I want to give one more example as we wrap up. And this is my brother, Doug. Many of you asked me about my brother, Doug. My brother, Doug, was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. They gave him three weeks to three months to live when they found the cancer. He was 43 or 44 years old, co collegiate athlete, never drank or did drugs, very, very healthy man all of his life. He was a stockbroker with Edward Jones Investments uh, in Boise, Idaho. And uh, they basically told him, you need to make your final preparations because this cancer is everywhere. It's in your spinal cord. It's in your bones. It's in your lungs. It's in your brain. And so they prepared the family. You know, there's really nothing that we could do uh, for him. And we prayed, and our church prayed, and churches all over the world were praying for Doug because he lived in Australia for many years, and his wife is uh, an Australian national, and they had lots of friends in Australia, and the church is praying all over the country. And, you know, it was one miracle after another, after another, after another. And the latest update uh, on Doug is, is this. So this is from my, uh, his wife, my sister-in-law, Leanne. She says, time for an update on Dougie. I'm so happy to say that Doug is doing well. I've been holding off on posting any news until he had another round of scans done. He had a CT some weeks ago and an MRI this last time. It was hard to get clear results from the CT as there was still inflammation from the fluid issues he had in his lungs and chest. Hopefully his next CT will tell us more. However, the MRI revealed wonderful news. 
normal brain MRI, no evidence of neoplastic disease, i.e. tumor growth. In layman's terms, no evidence of tumors on his brain. In his last MRI, he had eight pin-sized tumors. You can imagine how relieved and encouraged we feel. We don't meet with his oncologist until next week, but I think it's safe to say that the treatment appears to be working. The cancer was not only stopped, it was reversed. It disappeared, and now he's getting healthier and healthier, and he's driving again, and he's going back to work again in January. They didn't even think he was going to live for three months, and he was diagnosed in February uh, of 2022. And so these are miraculous healings. I mean, they, doctors could take the credit. They could credit the, you know, drugs that they're using. But the reality is, is the doctors initially had no hope for my brother. But we all started praying, and all of a sudden, God started answering our prayers. And, and my brother, Doug, uh, is, is doing very, very well. And thank you for your continued prayers for Doug. Please continue to pray for him and his family for a total healing. Because this is a miracle, and this is against all the odds and this is showing the power of our God uh, at work in, in our lives. Again, some are not healed. God chooses to heal them in heaven. We had a very dear sister uh, in Tehachapi, Sharon Jacobs, who just out of the blue, she was healthy and had no problem. She was in her late 60s. She, they found a tumor in her brain, uh, and uh, the tumor was cancerous, stage 4. And she was dead six weeks after finding the tumor, and I, you know, she, she passed away, but she knew Jesus, so she's healed now in heaven. So if God doesn't heal us now of our diseases or infirmities, just trust that the Lord will heal you and give you a perfect, sinless, whole, complete, perfect body uh, forever and ever in heaven, and you won't have to worry about sickness, disease, uh, or anything like that anymore. All right, let's pray. And Father, we do thank you for these miracles, Lord. We thank you for these testimonies. We thank you, Lord, that you still heal us today, Lord. We thank you that there's nothing impossible for you. I pray for any who are here today who are sick, Lord, any listening to my voice online, Lord. I pray that you would touch and heal them now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would work miracles, Father, that you would do supernatural uh, healings in our midst, Father. We thank you for the testimonies of all of these that you have healed, Lord God, even here in our church, in, in my own family, with my brother Doug, Lord, uh, the healings up into Hatchapi against all odds that I have witnessed, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are still in the business of healing the sick today, that there's nothing impossible for you, God. There's nothing difficult for you. And so, Father, I do pray that you would touch and heal the sick among us today, Lord, that you would set the captives free, Lord. For any that have opened the door to demonic activity in their lives or in their homes, Lord, through practicing witchcraft or sorcery or Satanism, Lord, I pray you would set them free, Lord God. I pray you would cleanse their houses, Lord, that you would cleanse their bodies, Father God, and that you would heal them as well, Father. We thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes we are healed, Lord. You heal us spiritually of sin and of the consequences of our sin, Lord. Thank you for salvation, Lord, thank you for delivering us from the kingdom of darkness and bringing us into your glorious kingdom of light. Bless us, watch over us, keep us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.